So thank you, Rick, and uh, thanks everybody uh, for for being here at one of the real conversations that Congressman Rush and I had when we first uh, when we gathered that day at his office uh, when where where GCI came out of that meeting was you know the importance of not having a meeting and then just kind of going away and everybody going back to their lives, but of staying connected. I'm here as a vice chair of World Business Chicago um, and a member of the Mayor's Economic Council in that regard. I work very closely uh, with, uh, with Andy, um, but I'm also just here as a, as a citizen and as, as a, as a uh, member of the business community. And um, uh, I think that we've you, we've talked about a lot of things today uh, that are sort of truly important uh, on, on many levels. And I think there are uh, various sort of angles we, can, we could take to the importance of the issues broadly defined writ large that we're talking about. You talk about equality, social justice. I think that there is an economic angle. There is an economic conversation. And as a business person, sometimes I find that sort of comfort uh, or uh, in, in comfort uh, pushing for change inside, inside the numbers. So I just want to start there and make a couple of comments you've probably heard earlier uh, today. Um, uh, but there are issues of inclusiveness, segregation, inequality sort of broadly defined here in Chicago are real. To deny them is, uh, is frankly a waste of time uh, and, uh, and, and uh, they're, they're, they're very real. But they're, uh, and they're, they're a problem. And they're real and a problem here, but they're real and a problem in cities all across the country. And equality and inequality is a problem, inclusiveness you know, outside of the, the U.S. as well. It's a problem, they're problems, but it's an opportunity. And that's, I think, in part what we have to make sure that everybody understands. So Metropolitan Planning Council, uh, $8 billion gross regional product opportunity, 30% drop in homicides from narrowing the gap in our uh, inequality for driving inclusiveness forward, for reducing uh, segregation. And so, uh, and, and of that, 4.4 uh, 4 billion of that opportunity, uh, direct benefit to the African American community. That means $3.6 billion outside of the African American community. That's 3.6 billion reasons that, that everybody ought to be working together to drive the issues that we're covering today, to drive inclusive growth and to make progress. We, we have to talk about problems, we have to talk about issues, but we also should talk about opportunity. We also have to make sure that everybody understands that there's real value and real opportunity to working on these problems and these issues together. And, you know, like any salesperson, uh, uh, you, you know, you have, your, your pitch varies slightly. Uh, based on, on where you are and who you're addressing at that point in time. But there is, you know, there's a, there's a business community uh, and there's a community that are less directly impacted uh, by the problem, seeing it every day and feeling it every day, but can understand that economic opportunity. And I think it's important, um, uh, I think it's Im important not to, uh, uh, not to lose sight of that uh, uh, at all in, in the conversation. We've got a problem. That problem is an opportunity. That's an opportunity that we should all be working on together. I think our goal is in a year or at some point in time, we're going to come back. You're going to host us again. We're going to have this meeting, but we're going to merge this meeting with the meeting that we had going on down the hall uh, at the same time where a number of, of our, all of our, of our friends who were you know, Fortune 200 uh, CEOs were meeting with the head of the Federal Reserve. And when we have this meeting here merged with that meeting at the same time, that's going to be, Congressman, some more progress that we've made. Won't be enough, 
won't be finished, but that'll be more progress than we made. So I think we can kind of think about that as a goal and ask at some point in the next year or two when we get on the agenda and kind of pull a meeting like that together uh, through your good graces. And that would be um, uh, a terrific thing to do. Uh, institutional bias, conversation that has fortunately and in a good way taken on much more of a dynamic nationally over the last uh, uh, several years. Um, interesting for me, doing a lot of work alongside the city, with the city, sometimes uh, at, uh, over at City Hall, and with other institutions to kind of think about that and reflect on that and see what that is. And, and think about is that, what, what it, you know, where, how, does that, how does that happen? How does it manifest itself? Is it, is it something that exists inside, inside people? Uh, uh, is it something that exists inside institutions? And having had the good fortune to work with a number of very, very good people, my conclusion is, as Andy alluded to earlier, that this is actually institutional and structural that comes from long periods of time. And it's not um, uh, necessarily, and, and, and certainly, uh, and not necessarily today, it doesn't mean it's not at times, but it's not necessarily, and it's not necessarily today, intent. It is actual structural bias that has been built up over a period of time where the job that needs to be done isn't necessarily anyone's job. And so Andy going over as deputy mayor, having neighborhood economic development as a job, having the ability to roam and go to every area inside and try to bang and direct and move change is a very good thing because you can have really, really terrific, wonderful people who are very intensely focused in a high-pressure environment on doing their job and therefore may not be seeing some of these institutional or structural blind spots. So I, that's what I've kind of come to believe that structural institutional biases and what we all have to sort of think about and guard against. And for me, the framework for dealing with some of that is actually pretty simple. Uh, and it's not, uh, Terry would not think it was, you know, highest and best principles of, uh, of uh, planning and things like that, but it's, it's pretty simple, which is we just have to structurally ask the questions every time we do anything are we being inclusive? How is what we're doing driving inclusiveness? Are we focused on neighborhood? How is what we're doing focusing on neighborhood? And are we focused on marginalized community? And how is what we're doing focusing on our marginalized community? And those are lenses. And if we literally run everything we do through those three lenses, it, you know, everything that we do will get, you know, somewhat better. Ultimately, a lot of it comes down to money, comes down to your question. Uh, and, and, you know, we all get it. I mean, there is no, I get it. There's no, m money, money, money. And without that, with, it's, it's hard to drive change at the speed that anybody would like to see it. And, you know, unfortunately, post-2008, we're dealing with a very rough uh, economic, uh, uh, economic environment with a lot of pressure on the, on the public sector, which means that the role of the private sector and the philanthropic sector needs to uh, be bigger. Not saying the public sector gets a pass at all, uh, but uh, we've got to be kind of a, a community and we have to find money. So where do we find it and how do we find it and how do we uh, see it? Kind of my view is there are great investment opportunities here in Chicago in our neighborhoods, and there are professionals that will want to deploy that capital here in Chicago in our neighborhoods. Uh, and so that has, to me, a fair amount of promise and could be a fairly significant amount of money. Uh, the last thing I just want to mention is World Business Chicago. Uh, we have a number of core functions. We uh, recruit and attract and try to retain businesses here in Chicago, we have a research function that sort of looks at and studies the economy. We get a tremendous amount of help from the Fed 
uh, on that. Uh, we have a function where we will lead delegations or welcome delegations from outside of uh, Chicago. That includes uh, our sister city's effort. Uh, and then we have uh, a, an economic planning and development uh, effort, the Plan for Economic Growth and Jobs, that Terry Mazzani and Bob Weisborn uh, were so instrumental in, in, in creating and birthing. That entire effort, the Plan for Economic Growth and Jobs, has been oriented towards uh, inclusive growth and inclusive growth and, and intentional investment. That's what we're focused on. We're focused on it throughout other aspects of the whole firm as well, but the plan for economic growth and jobs is uh, going, uh, is, um, is uh, focused on inclusive growth and intentional investment, and that's what we're going to try to do, and we're going to try to be sort of that connector uh, between neighborhood economic development efforts, understanding that they need to be community-driven, community-led, not proscriptive, but neighborhood economic development efforts with the private sector and the philanthropic sector. And we want to try to play a role there and try to be helpful there and try to work with GCI and other organizations and other uh, communities and see if we can do some good there. So thank you very much for having me here today. Appreciate it uh, very much and appreciate just being able to share with you a little bit how I look at things and what we're trying to do. Thanks.